Let's go, folks. Time for the Gibby Show. Hey, Doom Baseball fans. Welcome to another edition of the Gibby Show, brought to you by our friends at Miller Lite, the official beer of Major League Baseball and the Gibby Show. I'm John Arezzi, and joining me from a place where the heat misery index is oppressive, Ooh. he's a former New York Mets catcher, member of the last Mets team to win a world championship in 1986. He's a two-time manager, Toronto Blue Jays, best-selling author, back on the best-selling list this week, the man who always tells it like it is, and direct from the hottest place in the United States right now, San Antonio, Texas. Here he is, the baseball life himself. John Gibbons. Johnny, how are you, man? Yeah, when they say the hottest place, it's not because it's a good place to be right now. It's smoking down here. Yeah. I heard the uh, the heat index uh, is... About what, 120. 120. And what is that in, uh, you know, they measure it differently up north. Yeah, I don't know how they figure that, but like I think the temperature is like low 100s, but then it feels like 120. So better to stay inside. That's a, That's oppressive for sure. And uh, we uh, just uh, had Father's Day. How did that go, John? How did you good, good. You know, two of my, two of my kids are at, out of state. My daughter and I, Jordan, we went and had a nice dinner last night. So, yeah. It's a, did, did she serenade you? No. <laughs> no, she's a sweetheart. No, no. But, we, you know, we, we, we reminisced about it. A lot of good things we've had, you know. Well, Jordan, of course, uh, just such a talented singer, songwriter, and uh, just a big fan of hers. Well, well. thank you, Jenny. Uh, well, let's talk a little baseball today. Uh, we will discuss what's going on with the Blue Jays momentum or lack of momentum as we head into the end of the first half of the season. Really looking forward to uh, gabbing with Gibby this week, brought to you by Tim Hortons. Joining us will be a true legend in Jays history. He was the voice of the Jays for 35 years, uh, Jerry Haworth. We will also have another Roast and Toast inspired by our friends at Miller Lite as well. But let's get right into it with the leadoff. Well, John, uh, the Jays are down in Florida. They had a horrific game on Sunday. They had a 6 nothing lead, uh, and uh, they blew it. A lot of things happened. It could have been the worst uh the worst loss of the season. Uh, they went um, two and four since the last time we taped here. Uh, they're on their way to Florida, so uh, it's not been a good uh, good trip for them at all. There were some reports that came out that on their way to Florida today, uh, by the way, the six-run lead that they blew was the largest in J- by the Jays in a regular season loss since July 28, 2019. Uh, John Schneider, the manager, uh, quoted as saying, uh, we have to tighten things up, whether it's on the mound or in the field. You score runs, you have a six-run lead. Pitchers are going to have tough days, whether it's Chris or guys out of the pen. It's getting over to first base to cover, making sure you have a good throw in. We're going to reconvene in Florida, and we're going to talk about this stuff. This is too good of a team to let the floodgates open. All right, so what, is, what does Schneider do? Does he rattle the cage? What do you do at this point where the team is, is, is floundering right now? Yeah, Johnny, well, you know what? Every manager's different. Everybody has their own personalities. Every, uh, you know, uh, usually when the team meetings come out, they're not advertised, you know. They just kinda, you just kind of have them, and, and uh, maybe somebody told him he needs to have one or something. Cause, but, you know, it's kind of – you want to know the truth. Of course, it's just personal opinion, but – you know, the, the time for talking and things like that, you know, everybody's talking all the time. You know, you get tired of doing that, right? Players get tired of hearing it. And that's not, you know what, that's not any advice from me. It's just the reality of baseball. I was in baseball forever, right? As a player, you know, you okay, we think when your team's not playing up to expectations, it's not always about having a team meeting because cause then players tune you out. I'm telling you, they do because I was a player. And then as a manager, I, I was, you know – I, th- I sometimes I can, you know, it's like, cause you know what, every, they, they know what's going on. If anybody, the people know more what's going on, the actual players in there, but, but everybody has their own style and I can't, it works. Everything works differently for other It's different people, but bottom line, you know what? The truth, the reality is right now, they're half game out of a wild card. You think that's, 
optimistic. Well, our guest, our guest later today on uh, Gavin with Gibby is the ultimate in positive thinking, right? But your half game out of a wild card is in the team hasn't, you know, it hasn't really put it together like everybody expects. So they've had a nice little run, but my guy, that would be thankful if you want to know the truth, you know, and think, you know what? Hey, because there's, he could have very, very well have disappeared. And they're still one of the better teams. So I, yeah, there's I'll, obviously even, even the Tampa Bay Rays, you know, you know they, they got some things like, you know, they were, I was watching a game in Oakland the other night. They were running it outs here and there. The pro, the difference is they're sitting in first place. It's all, mm-hmm. it's, it's all relative where you're sitting, right? Your team's winning. It, every, it covers everything. Your team's not. So everybody has the same issues and all that. Yeah, there's, you need to tighten some things up, but every team's done that every, every year. I think sometimes things get a little lax here and there. But the bottom line is I, I, if I was to look at it, they haven't really been able to put the pitching and the hitting together for any length of time. And the offense has been is, hasn't been what it, what it's it's been cracked up to be yet. Yet I'm going to say that yet. You know, uh, yeah. They, once once that happened, but 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 you know, we're not even the halfway mark. You know, but getting getting right. close. Yeah, but yeah, I'll, we're getting very close. Uh, but you're kind of looking at it as a half glass full rather than half glass empty because they're still only half a game out of wild card. The end of the day, at the end of the season, you got to be in it to win it. And you got to be in there, whether you're the Eastern Division champions or if you're the third team in the wild card, you're in it at that point. And being a half a game out at this point, that's, in your opinion, half glass full, I would take it. Yeah. And, and, you, and you know, yeah, it hasn't. It, do we all wish we be, could be the Tampa Bay Rays and get that kind of, after that kind of a start? Yeah, of course. But that, that's rare. That doesn't happen. And if you, like we talked about, I think on our last show, you track the history of the, the winners the last few years, they were all hovering around that 500 mark and they made their move the second half. Look at the San Francisco Giants. They were a few games under 500 a few weeks ago and they're, they're hotter than fire. Blue Jays are going to get hot. There's, there's, there's no, they can't, they're too good not to, but you know what? Sometimes things don't work out as planned for whatever reason, you know, whether it's, you know, and that's just, you know, that's just, that's just baseball, right? Yeah. So as a manager, you don't have all the answers. You know, you put the best team you can on the field and you let the guys play because that's what they're supposed to do. And that's what they're paid all this money to do. So as a manager, all right, you advise, you structure the lineup, you put the best guys in, you make your moves. But then, you know, the guys take the field. It's up to them to perform. Yeah. Well, you know what happens, Johnny? You know, and I'm an outsider now. We're all on the outside looking in. But this is the beauty of baseball, right? We sit there and we pick our favorite team. We analyze it to death. We think we all got the answers right. You, you, people, I, I don't think people always realize that they're doing the same thing in house, right? You know, the players are the players are trying to, or you know, they want to win every game. It's not there's there's no lack of effort. I guarantee you that. You know, they 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 play a good brand of baseball. They play hard. You know, it's just sometimes it's a freaking tough game to play, and they just played, you know, the team ahead of them, Baltimore, and they play the team leading the the American League West, the Texas Rangers, who are pretty damn good. So, but it's, you know, and then you get, then you got all this information age. They got all the info on everything, right? You got, you got, now there's like two or three times as many coaches on a staff. Yeah. And, you know, you know, so, so there's, uh, you get you're bombarded with, all with analytics. I mean, yeah. you're bombarded so, and it's just like, it's like, it just overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but I'm just saying, if, if we on the outside can't figure it out, you don't think that you don't think they're scratching their heads trying to figure it out, you know? But sometimes the freaking this just a tough game to play, and you got to deal with it. And you know what? Maybe find a, a little line, a silver line, in that you know we're half game out, boys. Um, That's right. I mean, that is kind of you know for a Jays fan listening to this or watching it on YouTube, you're a half a game out of a wild wild card spot. And I would do anything as a as a Mets fan to be where the Jays fans are right now. I would. It's uh it's all per- perspective. Yeah, it would, would be ideal. It could, this is what happens when you everybody crowns you champ before they even play play one game, right? And they think, you know, I've been through that before too. This, you know, yeah. I, I know how that feels. And you scratch your head on some things, but you know what? The players feel it more than anybody, and they're out there busting their butt. They're the guys in the arena. You know what? They they don't like to hear take the heat. They want to get a knock every time the guy in scoring position. They're not up there trying. Uh, I, I could care less what happens. No. So, but so well, you know what happens sometimes? You put so much pressure on yourself. Sometimes you talk yourself into things or you hear so much crap coming from the outside. Where the, some of the best remedies you used to be, it, it was like, screw it, boys. Just go out and have fun. Go out and get them, right? You know, go, go, go. You guys have a good night out on the town. Go de- get to dinner or something, loosen up. 
and you come back and play instead of, you know, overanalyzing everything. And that's sometimes the best remedy because we, our mind gets in the way of the game sometimes in, in the sport of baseball. Yes, it does. And uh, it's just going to be interesting to see as the schedule unfolds here. You are listening to The Gibby Show. It's presented by Miller Lite. So, John, Father's Day, I'm sure you had to have a Miller Lite or two. Yeah, just not because it was, it was Father's Day, just because it tasted like Miller time. I think. That's right. <laughs> yeah, no, you know what? Hey, but I had it. did have a wonderful day. I had me a couple and spent some time with my daughter and, and uh, you know, I've, you know, I have a lot to be thankful for. Yes, indeed. And we are thankful for our friends over at Miller Lite as well. They've been great to us. Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite, great taste, 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Uh, Gibby? Let's talk about Vladdy for a second. Uh, had a rough game uh, this past Sunday. Uh, uh, got caught off base, whatever. But a lot of people are just kind of comparing him to what his career has been up to this point. He's still hitting pretty well. He's got nine home runs. There could be improvement there, I guess. But he's kind of been the biggest um, mystery of the team this year. Uh, for example, it's nine home runs. Danny Jansen has as many. Uh, Dalton Varsho has 12. That's a startling comparison in a way. But uh, have you seen anything in Vladdy this year that's given you cause for concern? No, Johnny, I, I can't, can't. Like I said a minute ago, and I'm sure everybody's trying to figure out. This is what happens, though, when you come in, you're, you're touted as, you know, the, the, uh, as a a guy that's got a chance to be a Hall of Fame type player. And he does, you know, he, he is one of the most talented kids and he set the bar early, right? And so if he struggles at all or or if it gets off to a slow start, what have you, everybody always thinks, you know, there's something wrong and something wrong. And yeah, he's not he's not his norm right now. But you he's know what? He's still yeah, hitting Yeah, well, but they don't they, but the, but the baseball OPS world does. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 where that's that's where they're looking cuz they don't they don't even care about batting average, average anymore, number, right? Exactly. No. So yeah, it is. It is surprising he hasn't hit, hit, hit hasn't hit a home run or it, it, at home. You know that is that is kind of a mystery. Home run since September thirtieth. But but I will tell you this. You know he'll he'll. I my gut tells me he'll finish strong because he has a track record even at, at such a young age. But I guarantee you this that when when there's guys on base in in, in, in crunch time. He's a guy you don't want to see coming to the plate if you're on the other team, you know. Remember, I asked Buck, Buck Showalter. He should have. He didn't walk him that time down in, <laughs> in New York, and you know, yeah, I mean, it cost him. because you know, because this guy can hit. He may not. He may. He may be down in home runs, but he's still a, a damn good hitter. He can fire out some line drives, all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, but they need him to get a little more production. There's no doubt about it. But you got to remember too, these everybody in that lineup gets four or five at bats max a game, right? So one guy can't do it all. You got to be steady throughout the lineup, and uh, you know it's just it's just it's just a rut they're in right now. But I guarantee a big part of it's everybody's focusing on it. They're hearing it all the time, and they're, you know what they're trying they're 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 trying too hard in a lot of cases. I will guarantee you that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that'll wrap up the lead off, and now it's time for gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons. Hello, friends. <laughs> exactly. Uh, before we get to our special guest, let's talk about Tim's. Tim's new barbecue crispy chicken loaded bowls and wraps are here. It's barbecue on barbecue experience. Delicious ingredients like crispy seasoned chicken tossed in a smoky barbecue glaze and topped with a creamy barbecue sauce. Try them now at Tim's for a limited time. Hey, good stuff, man. I love barbecue too. Plus, I'm starting to try try a little bit of that um, high protein diet, cut down on some carbs. So, you know, you can't go wrong with barbecue, right? There you go. You can. But still, still got to be moderation, though. But uh, which I don't understand. But uh, good stuff over there, Timmy Hortons. All right, let's get to Gabby with Gibby. Today on Gabbing with Gibby, brought to you by Tim Hortons, we have one of the most memorable personalities in the history of Blue Jays baseball. He covered the team for more than 36 years in the radio booth 
and his tandem with the late Tom Cheek will never be forgotten. Tom and Jerry were together for 23 years as Voices of the Jays broadcast. His book, Hello Friends, Stories from My Life and Blue Jays Baseball, is a favorite of Jays fans everywhere. Everybody knows him. It's an honor to welcome to Gabbing with Gibby this week, Jerry Howarth. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Jerry, man. Oh, I tell you what, dude. I, I miss you. You know, I miss a lot of things about, you know, my last year was 18. You know, I, I, miss, I miss the competition. I miss the boys in the clubhouse. And and I miss you, man. You know, the, the all the fun we had. The uh, You know, we're together every day, man. It's almost like a marriage, for crying out loud. And uh, well, it I was, miss it. It was great, John. And uh, I'm going to share a quick story. Of course, you came aboard, I think, in um, 2000 and... Um, Four. 2004 and jp richardi hired you you're out in the bullpen as a coach and so we go through spring training and now we're about a week into the season and i'm standing at the batting cage and you're right there and you said jerry i said yes you said this is john gibbons i'm one of the coaches here too (laughs) (laughs) i hadn't really talked to you that much because you were in the bullpen every day working so hard with all the pitchers and that's how we started ladies and gentlemen and John is one of my best friends, and when I look at my career, it, it just was tremendous uh, to be with you, John, and to share not only your first year as a manager with the Blue Jays, but the second tenure, too, in 2015 and 2016. Uh, you, too, like Cito, could have gone and won two World Series. You were that close to doing it. Yeah, uh, Jerry, you didn't know who I was because you man, we always accused you of being a front runner, hanging out with the big boys, man. I was just a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> and well, you were right to do that. Well, and then I found out too in your background um, when you played Little League, your first at bat was in Canada, and I thought we were meant to be together. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, hey, Johnny, what do you got for this young man? Well, you know, I really am. Uh, it seems like the connection that both of you have with each other has gone on for years. Uh, Jerry, I mean, what's that interaction with the manager during the course of a season? Obviously, you and Gibby were really close. So share some of us. Uh, Did you guys, uh, you give him any advice? Does he ask you for (laughs) advice during this season when he was managing? Because you seem to have a a, a strong bond with each other that developed pretty quickly. Well, that's exactly right. And one of the pleasures I had in my career was I did the manager show before every game down on the field. So not only that, but I was at the batting cage and uh, my I would get out to the ballpark around two thirty, quarter to three, purposely to spend two hours down on the field with not only our managers, but the coaches and the players on the other team and our players, of course, and the umpires. And it was a wonderful two, two and a half hours of preparation day in and day out in order to then take all that upstairs and share it with the audience across Canada. So when I first met John, I found out right away it was we had such an easy rapport together. It was back and forth and nice and easy. And I'd have to say to answer your question, I always went with the flow that they're the manager. They're doing all they can to win every ball game, and you don't win them all. There's probably about 40 games that you don't win no matter what, 40 you win no matter what, and then the other 82 determine how far you go as far as a playoff team. And John was very good. What I really appreciated about him was – the easy rapport he had with his team, and yet he could be firm when he had to be too, but the players were very comfortable around him. And one thing I always look for, John, in a manager was how do they delegate authority? And John was very good at delegating authority to all of his coaches and then letting his players play and his pitchers pitch. And they never had to look over their shoulders. They knew that John had their back, and that made it very easy for me day in and day out to see that. Yeah, and hey, this- having the players back all the time also, I mean, you were also a uh, witness to many ejections that uh, that Gibby had over the course of his career as manager of the Jays. Uh, how was that like, uh, constantly looking down and say, uh-oh, here we go again, he's getting thrown out again, you know? So, <laughs> Well, along those lines, there was always a good reason for a manager to get tossed. And when I saw what had happened, the first thought came to my mind was, John's going to be out here pretty quick because that deserves to have an umpire know that that was the poor call. And of course, a lot of times when John was a manager, they don't have what they have today. 
instant replay and you go right back and you determine whether it was out or safe or whatever it happened to be. But John always had a legitimate argument. And then you could be firm too, as he was. And when you felt that you had the right case and pushed it, then it was up to the umpire to either accept that or to run him. And it kind of went both halfway uh, each way. But overall, uh, those are the kind of things a manager has to do in order to let his players see that too and send a message to them. I've got your back, fellas, and that was not a good call. Hey, Jerry, for crying out loud, you're, you're building me up so good. This show's the best supposed to be about you. We, you're the guest on here. We got to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got your email, and I'm just reading it verbatim here. <laughs> about, <laughs> about you. Hey, oh, Jerry, man, I tell you, I, tell you I, I, I miss our time together. I really did. We became more than just, you know, uh, What's what's the word? I'm not very educated. Uh, well, family. co-workers. When they yeah, became families, is it just the co-workers? But one thing I want everybody to know that J Jerry it really helped me out along the way. You know, you listen to me on the show, you probably think I'm not very good talking on these shows and all that. But Jerry, actually, when I first started, you know, the biggest part of a job for the manager is the media. You know, dealing with the media every day and all that. And Jerry was kind enough to he he'd help me through. He he. He'd listen to me talk, even when I, when I did my interviews with him, or he'd listen to when I was doing other interviews, and he kind of critiqued it in his mind. And then he come, and then he later that day or the next day, he, he'd share it with me, saying, "Hey, listen, why don't you try this or that?" And and uh, and it was really valuable. You know, at first I was going, "The hell do you know?" But I, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the one well, time I, but your favorite thing, you always say, "Hey," he said, "Do you know how many times you said you know?" In that in that interview, I just I said, I don't know how many you said. I mean, it was like off the charts how many. And I said, well, well so he goes, well, if they ask you that question and you say, you know, if they knew, he would be asking the question for crying out. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, along those lines, I'm going to share something with your audience because they can use it as well, even though they're not on a major league field and down with the players. I would always tell people like John and later Alex Anthopoulos, who was one of my best friends, too, and. He meant so much to you and he meant so much to me. But in addition to you, when Alex was named the general manager with the Blue Jays, I heard him being interviewed a couple of times and that was enough. And I called him and I said, uh, let's meet together down on the field. So we met on the field the next day and I said, Alex, I just heard you being interviewed. You're guilty of what I call the Fab Five. You say, I know. I wanna, I gonna, uh, and there was one other one too, and I can't quite remember. You know, I mean, that's it. You know, I mean, uh, wanna, <laughs> gonna. And I told Alex right then, and I'll tell your audience here, there's no such word as wanna, it's want to. There's no such word as gonna, it's going to. And then after that, you don't have to link sentences with uh, I mean, you know. After I told Alex that, I heard him interviewed the next day, and a week later I said, Alex, you've eliminated all Fab Five. Congratulations. Way to go. And you did the same thing too, John. You listened, you applied, and I thought that was the key uh, to anybody. Do they listen? And if they listen, then they learn and they say, I'm not going to do that. And thank you, Jerry, for saying that. So somewhere along the line here today, Someone in your audience is going to start to say, wanna, gotta, they're going to say, here, they're going to say, no, I can't do that. That's not a word. Uh, I mean, you know, don't go there. Hey, Jerry, what are you talking about? That's all we say down here in South Texas for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm a California boy from San Francisco. Yes, you are, brother. There's no doubt about it. You sound a little more sophisticated than I do. <laughs> well, you and I have been blessed, John. You know, you're you a Texan. I'm a Californian. I've lived up here for 42 years and uh, you enjoyed your time here in Canada, too. Toronto has been a wonderful city. How blessed are we to have spent so many years in another country and yet made it our own? Oh, yeah. Hey, uh, Gary, there's one thing, two people I don't think people know about you, that you coach basketball for how many years? 25 I, years. Yeah. I mean, it's like Bob Cousy out there or or. or, uh, or uh, what's the name? Larry Brown out there coaching basketball. Well, I enjoyed that too. My first couple of off seasons here, uh, I started to read books and 
after one winter of reading five or six books, I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I, I don't mind reading books, but it just wasn't that satisfying. And then our two sons, uh, Ben and Joe, were in the seventh and eighth grade, and there was a Saturday, like recreational league here to coach basketball. So as I saw them play, then I looked at, down on the court from where I was in the stands, and I said, Jerry, why don't you coach your own sons and see where it goes from there? So that very same year, I started coaching those kids in the uh, Etobicoke Basketball Association Saturday games. That led to coaching uh, at Islington Middle School for five years, including my two boys, and then 20 years at Etobicoke High School right here in the Toronto area. And John, I loved it because for 25 years, I emphasized education, get as much education after high school as you possibly can. And then after that, play defense. And if you do those two things, you'll make me very happy. We played for two city championships. We always held teams to under 40 points and it was a wonderful experience and the kids really enjoyed it. And they came back every year and said, coach, thank you very much. Hey, hey you know what? One of my favorite things of all time that I, I still think about when I think about you is since you, it has, it relates to your basketball a little bit, but you always knew what opening day was, right? People go, what, what does that have to do with this? Right? Opening day. On opening day, you were always dressed up, man. You, and you wore your, your nice dress shoes and all that. That was just the number one day. One then day. After, then after that, you come out there in them damn tennis shoes, man. And it was your old, your basketball <laughs> shoes, man. You wore. <laughs> yeah, I've never been a clothes horse at all. Uh, and you're exactly right. Uh, formality for a day. And after that, enjoy 161 <laughs> other games. Uh, you know what? I tell people, this is the honest to God truth. I own two pair of shoes, one pair of tennis shoes that I wear every day and one pair of dress black shoes that I wear probably five times a year. <laughs> and that's true. Now, my wife, if you go into her closet, there's 20 pair of shoes here, but for me, just two. <laughs> I get it, Johnny. <laughs> yeah, I got a few questions here. Um, the first is, uh, I don't know if you knew this or not, of course, you're both authors, and um, and Jerry, your book, Hello, Friends, Stories from My Life. Hello, Friends. Blue Jays Baseball. Uh, did you uh, have any help with that book, or did you write it yourself? Okay, I'm going to start right here, John, with this. How about ah, that? There play? you go. Thank you, baby. There you have go. you read it? Have you read it, or are you just, you're just using it oh as like gosh. a copy holder? I, I bought it probably two months ago. It took me about three days to read. And John, it was a wonderful book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And it says right here, Tales of a Baseball Lifer. That's what you are. And as a broadcaster, that's what I was too. We were both baseball lifers. John, as far as your question regarding Hello Friends, uh, I wrote that by myself. Here's what happened. About uh, eight or nine years ago, um, I didn't even consider writing a book. Then I was down on the field one day with Buck Martinez, who was our former catcher, who was our former manager, who was our former and still is now currently our TV broadcaster. And um, Buck came over to me and he said, Jerry, uh, I've written two or three books. I think you should write a book. And I hadn't even thought about it that seriously. He said, here's why. You have so much experience. You've been with this team almost since the very beginning. You have so many great stories to tell. I would encourage you to write a book. I said, Buck, thank you. I'll take that home and think about it. Well, I did. And at the end of the 2015 season, in the off season, while I still coach basketball, I, I wrote about 60,000 words and I said, I can do this. Then the next off season, I wrote another 60,000 words. I had 120,000 words. And finally, uh, going into the uh, 2019 year, I cut that down to about 102,000 words. I edited it myself, I wrote it myself. I didn't want to go strider. I wanted somebody uh, who would look and encourage me to do that, and that was Buck. And then the book came out in March of 2019. And I was so happy to write it. It was me, the first 50 pages. I always tell people, read the first 50 pages, if nothing else. It's a story of my life, how I grew up, what happened in my life, how I got to a point where I came to Toronto. And then the rest of it are just simply stories from my experience up in the radio booth with people like John and Cito and so many others and the players, coaches, managers, uh, uh, umpires. It was a tremendous experience. And when I finally submitted it to ECW Press right here in Toronto, I said to myself, Jerry, 
You've written 102,000 words. You've cut it down. You've edited it. It's exactly what I wanted. It's your best performance. My one and only book, one and done. And I was so happy to write it. Became a bestseller across Canada. And I was so happy to do that. So you both hey. are bestsellers now. I mean, uh, Gibby's book was on the bestsellers list this week. Uh, and uh, Jerry, yours. The other question I have for you regarding the book. I mean, there is an audio book out, correct, on this? Yes. Uh, they asked me to do that, too. And uh, I'm going to pause right here because I just showed you the front of John's book. On the back is one of my comments about John, and I was so happy to do that. And basically, for me, the two best managers in the history of the Blue Jays were Cito Gaston and John Gibbons, 1 and 1A. One John showed so many qualities that Cito had as well, and they were two special individuals and human beings, even before putting on a uniform and becoming outstanding managers and delegators. They had a sixth sense for the game. So... Happy to do that, too. And when I think about uh, writing a book and how fun it was and interesting, John, it was uh, it was truly my pleasure. And it was a different, uh, I guess, Gibby, this one is to you, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Jerry, the, the broadcaster, uh, John, you weren't, you know, a broadcaster. Now you're the media darling. But uh, uh, that experience of doing the audio book uh, was probably a little bit different. Uh, with Jerry doing his and John, you reading yours. So, well, and let me just let me just say this before we get to Gibby's comment uh, regarding an audio book. I had cancer surgery in November of 2016, and uh, they removed uh, my prostate gland, a tumor. And uh, luckily for me, it was all a wonderful um, job by Dr. Rob Dam here at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto. But after that, my sleep, my stamina, my voice, everything else began to deteriorate. Now, I'm alive because of that surgery, but it took uh, uh, enough out of me that at the end of the 2017 season, I retired because I just couldn't go any further. About the only thing I had left was they asked me, could you do a voice? Could you do a, an audio book? And I said, I'll try. I wasn't even sure if I could do it. And over five days, I did the entire audio book. And really, John, that was not only a treat to do that for everybody else who uh, would, would enjoy an audio book. It was really the last time in my life that I had the stamina of my voice. And even a podcast like this, I'm doing it because of John. But overall, I don't do these things anymore because it's just not there within me. But I'm fine with that. I've had my career. I loved every moment. I had five years of AAA baseball before that. So I had a wonderful 41 years behind the microphone. And I always say thank you, God, for that, and um, I appreciate it. Hey, Jerry, I, I that was like one of the worst things I ever did recording that audio. But I mean, I loved it. I'm glad it's finished. I didn't admit it. it was so it was so hard. It was difficult, man. You know, I, I uh, well, see, you you wrote your own book. I didn't write mine, so I, so I probably coming in here and go, what did I say that? <laughs> no, I mean, let's go back. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. It was and it took five days because there were times where. You would go even reading three or four paragraphs, and then you had a little slip or whatever, and then you'd have to start over again, you know, at that particular point. But I had a real good editor, and we just kept going and going. And after five days, John, I felt so good that it was articulate, meaningful. It captured the book for those who – and I had met a number of people in my life, too, who were blind, who enjoyed the broadcast. And whether it was Tom and Jerry early on or myself with Alan Ashby – or later, Joe Siddle, who was my partner the last four years of my career, and he was tremendous. Uh, those people taught me, too. Jerry, on radio, describe, articulate, make it interesting for those who cannot see because you paint a picture for them. And when I did that with the audio book, too, I thought, this is going to be for all those who can't see. And I want them to actually hear the book because they can't read it. And it just made all the difference in the world. And one thing you have and I have, too, is... It's like a sincerity gene. It's not about us. It's never been about John Gibbons or Jerry Howard. It's about other people. And what we, what can we do with our forum and our platform for other people? And you and I have maxed that to the nth degree. And that's why we're best friends and why we did what we did. Yeah, the game, the game's been good to us, you know, and life's been good to both of us, you know. <laughs> it really has. It really has. And we've been blessed and um when I was in when I was at Santa Clara University in the San Francisco Bay Area, 
I started my four-year career there to graduate with a degree in economics and a minor in philosophy. And when I was 20 years old, my parents divorced. It was a bad situation growing up with a lot of fighting and temper and everything else. And at the age of 20, I had this priest, a Jesuit priest named John Shanks, Father Shanks, who next to my dad uh, was probably the most influential person in my life. And he taught me just a simple philosophy of life that I share with everybody here right now. And it's just simply two little sentences. And I've been living that since I was 20 years old. Here it is. Enjoy the moment like we are right now. You are not promised tomorrow. And because of that, when I look back in my life, I had, I have one sister. She had one child. And in 1998, Tracy, who was just blossoming as a young lady, she was 24 years old. She said, I've got a little bit of a headache. I'm going to lie down. And a half an hour later, she was gone. She had an aneurysm that burst. And then you and I both knew John Cerruti very well, who pitched for the Blue Jays, was a tremendous person, broadcaster. And before the last game of the season in Toronto, they had a meeting down on the field on Sunday, and he wasn't there. And they went up to his room there at the Sky Dome, and they found him in his bed. And they, he had his hands like this. He had a crucifix, a little cross there around his neck. And he had passed away as his heart had skipped a beat and then another one. Well, those are kind of, and I'll just share one other story here too. And why you enjoy the moment, you're not promised tomorrow. When I graduated from Santa Clara in 1968, I went through ROTC with many of my friends. So we became officers of the U.S. Army. I was assigned to Frankfurt, Germany, and I went over there to begin my career in Fifth Corps headquarters. John Box from L.A., we shared everything. He was from L.A., I'm from San Francisco. He went over as the first lieutenant to Vietnam. He was there for one month and stepped on a landmine and was killed instantly. We were each 22 years old. And when that happened, then I began to realize, Jerry, enjoy the moment. You are not promised tomorrow. And I say that to everybody because if you live that way, you have a full day. You put your head on the pillow at night. You say, thank you, Lord, for this day. If I'm blessed with tomorrow, let me do it again. And there you go. Jerry, that's that's special. You know, I can remember you, you you'd say that to me all the time. You know, we we could be the, the season might be in that grind moment or things aren't going well, and you'd always put things back in perspective. Like, hey, hey, think of the good things in your life. You know, you got this, you got this, you got this opportunity. You're playing a game. You know, and and you know you, you're that you're that one guy. There's not many in you people you come across in life like that, but you're that one guy in my life. You know, that you're always positive. You always put things in perspective. You, di you didn't sugarcoat it when things weren't good or when I wasn't good, you let me know. But that, you know, that's in, that's why you're such a special uh, individual, right? Because you had that impact on people's lives and you never changed. And I got to say, people, you know, in baseball is a grind. You do it every day, right? You see the same faces every day. You're one of the few guys that when you come down that field, I'm, I'm talking about with the coaches, staffs, and, and players, whatever team, you know, you go through different players every year. They enjoyed seeing you come out there, right? Some people come out and they go, "Oh, here comes so and so, right?" <laughs> Jerry, you, but the, but they would they would they would rag you, they tease you, they have fun with you. But say, "Here comes Jerry." People like having you around, you know. And, and just 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 what you spoke there, it's it's pretty special. And that really that that sums you up. Well, here's another story you'll enjoy too. Um, when the Blue Jays acquired Josh Donaldson, and thank you, Alex Anthopoulos, uh, again for what he did. And, what he's doing in Atlanta now, um, it's unbelievable. But so the Blue Jays acquired Josh Donaldson, and I'd really not met him before when he was with Oakland. So it's batting practice, spring training, and I'm down there, and I've always been sarcastic. I, I, I can have fun, but I like to tease people too. And So I start teasing Josh Donaldson at the batting cage, and the next thing I know, I'm a foot off the ground. He's pulling me up, and he's holding <laughs> me up against the batting cage. And I, I, I can't move. And he says, Jerry, what are you saying? You can't be sarcastic with me. And he's uh, just as bad as I was. And we're kidding each other. And I said, put me down on the ground. <laughs> he put me down on the ground. And that started a great friendship. Uh, one of my all-time favorite Blue Jays on and off the field. But that was Josh and that was Jerry. And we just clicked right from the very beginning because we had fun with people, John. And that's what it was all about. Hey, I got a I got a good uh, uh, batting cage story, and then we're gonna start. We're gonna talk about this baseball and the team, the Blue Jays team. We're uh, I don't know. Somebody challenged you, or maybe the, a couple of you, you media guys were in there taking BP one day, right? 
and you're going to remember this. And so I'm standing there with a couple of players by the cage, and you're in there hitting. You know, you weren't too bad, man. You actually swung it pretty good. And we, I look, and we just started laughing. We go, and I, and I point to the guy next to me. I said, "You, you see anything on Jerry right there?" And they looked. They said, "Oh, you were crying out loud! You just you'd taken your 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 uh, uh, slacks to the dry cleaners to get a clean, and you left the damn tag on the man. You're walking around all day." <laughs> I forgot about that. I did. Oh, you go, Jerry, for crying. He's, he's like Minnie Pearl, man, wearing that thing on her hat, man. She goes like, there's Jerry. Oh, gosh, we used to laugh. We had some good times. That is so funny. I forgot all about that. From that point on, they were looking for that same tag, which I would take <laughs> off. I forgot all about it. Oh, gosh, that is funny. I said, we can't take you anywhere for crying out loud. <laughs> See, and John, that's the beautiful part about our careers. We were in a sport which twice the number of games as basketball and hockey, 162, which meant that for six months, you really did get to know people, let alone the game, and then carry it to the radio or TV booth and send it across Canada so that the stories would make people come alive for everybody who was listening. You can't do that as much in hockey and and basketball because you're describing the quick action. But in baseball, it wasn't that a wonderful sport to truly get to know people and all the stories day in and day out that went with it. Oh, yeah. We, we, like you said, we've been blessed. Introducing Tim's Barbecue Crispy Chicken Loaded Bowls and Wraps. Freshly prepared with ingredients like crispy seasoned chicken that's tossed in a smoky barbecue glaze and topped with a creamy barbecue sauce. Can I take another bite? <laughs> Try them for a limited time, only at Tim's. All right, Johnny, fire away at old Jerry about some baseball. All right. Uh, you mentioned Josh Donaldson, and Josh, of course, uh, one of my personal favorites. Uh, uh, in your career, Josh became a good friend of yours. Who were some of the uh, favorite players of yours or friendships uh, over the course of your career with the Blue Jays? John, that's a great question. And I've been asked that many times in my career and here's how it starts. I had one favorite player and that was Tom Hankey, Tom Hankey on and off the field. And we're still great friends to this day. He was family. It was never about him. He was hardworking he had a humble beginning and he kept working through that to the point where he was finally called up in 1985 and he helped the Blue Jays uh, considerably as far as getting that opportunity to go to the playoffs. Tom Hankey then was with the Blue Jays right on through 1992. He was the closer and helped the Blue Jays significantly win their first ever World Series. But the reason I like Tom so much was because, again, when I saw people in, in my my son, Ben, uh, he would always say to me afterwards, he said, Dad, those people don't even realize that they were being interviewed by Jerry Howard. And what he meant was I would listen to people. I would throw out a question or two, just very short and simple and sweet, and I would listen to their response. And one of those who just told me how genuine he was and he loved his wife and four kids was Tom. And Tom and Kathy Hankey have four kids, and now they have grandkids. And uh, I just saw pictures that Tom sent me on Father's Day. We talked to each other on the phone every now and then. So that's where it starts. After that, I have a number of very good friends uh, that I made with the Blue Jays who are right there with Tom. And they were Sean Green out in right field, a tremendous person. And uh, he's out in Southern California right now. He went for the Blue Jays to the Dodgers. But I always enjoyed him. And one of the reasons was this. Uh, I was always down on the field for a post-game interview. My partner, Tom Cheek, would call the ninth inning. And so I was down there, and there were a number of games every season where the Blue Jays would lose a tough game, but I felt for our audience, they needed to hear a Blue Jays perspective. And whenever I went to Sean Green in those situations and said, Sean, do you mind if you come on the post-game show with me and everybody's leaving the dugout going to the clubhouse? He said, sure, Jerry, I'd be happy to do that. That was great respect I had for Sean, and he was just a tremendous athlete person, and, uh, and you would know, go from there. Then after that, you know, when I think about Jesse Barfield and Lloyd Mosby, they were just two tremendous individuals, too. And later, the Blue Jays acquired Paul Molitor and Josh Donaldson before that. So those became just great friends of mine and people that I could respect and like and enjoy because, again, they were talented people, but it was never about them. It was always the team. And then I have to throw Cito in there, too, because like John, 
Sita was very helpful to me as a broadcaster. He came to Toronto as a hitting coach. We came together the first year, 1982. That was my first season and uh, Sito's first season as a hitting coach. And then from there, I would learn so much at the batting cage from Sito. And I found out too, just how unselfish he was and pointed toward other people. And we had a lot of fun together. And I'd say, you know, and with others included, those would be my real favorites that stand out in my mind. I got one more historical uh, question for you. And uh, of course, your catchphrases are just uh, <laughs> better than everybody's minds. And hello, friends. And there she goes. Hello, friends. <laughs> <laughs> and there she goes. Uh, give us the origins of those two catchphrases. Well, I'll start uh, from the beginning here. I, I came up here in 1982, and my uh, my father came up to see me in 1983. My dad's name was Jerry, too, and I, was, I wasn't Jerry Jr., and I wasn't Jerome, which was his name. I was just Jerry, which he wanted. And in 1983, we're visiting a little bit, and he, he goes out to a few games at Exhibition Stadium, and the Blue Jays win a game or two, and he says to me, Jerry... He says, I have an idea for you you can use on the radio. I said, Dad, what is it? And he said, whenever you're at the microphone and the Blue Jays score the first run, of, they scored their first run in a game, why don't you say, and the Blue Jays are in flight? And I said, Dad, I love that. I never even thought about that. And the Blue Jays are in flight. And I said, Dad, I'm doing that for you the rest of my career. And I did for the last 34 plus years. The Blue Jays are in flight when I had the microphone and they had scored their first run. Well, it was also about 1983 that I'd never had a home run call in AAA baseball. I wasn't interested in being cute or fancy or anything like that. I just wanted to call the game and be basic and tell the fans what was happening and describe what was happening. Well, we're at Exhibition Stadium and um, I have the third inning and one of the Blue Jays hits a home run to left field up into the North Grandstand and it came out. And there it goes. And so as the home run was called and the Blue Jay hit home plate, I said to myself, hey, that's a possibility. I, I want to think about that. Maybe, maybe that's something I can use in the future. Well, the very next inning, I caught a break and another Blue Jay hit a home run. And this time it gave the Blue Jays the lead. And I said, and there she goes. And I said, Jerry, that's it. That's exactly <laughs> the home run call that I want to use and I use for the rest of my career. As far as Hello Friends, I was not the lead announcer. My partner, Tom Cheek, was the lead announcer for, we were together like 22 years. And yet, sadly, in 2004, in the middle of the season, he developed a malignant brain tumor that would take his life 16 months later. It was just so sad to see that happen because Tom had called 4,306 consecutive games before his father passed away when we were on the West Coast. And he went to be with his dad just an hour away from the Oakland, San Francisco Bay Area. Well, I, in the second half of that season, moved to the number one seat. And I said to myself, OK, Jerry, you've been here now since 1982. You know everybody across Canada. In the wintertime in January, I would go on the Blue Jays caravan from the East Coast to the West Coast. So I really got to know so many people across Canada. They were friends of mine. And I said to myself, I don't want to just come on the air now as the lead announcer for Tom and say, hello, everybody, or hi, everyone. I said, these are my friends. So I'm going to come on the air and say, hello, friends, this is Jerry Howarth, and welcome to Blue Jays Baseball. And that's what really started that, because I felt these were my friends. It was a whole different country that I would be a part of now for 15 years and would be for the rest of my life. And that's what started that. That's, that's awesome, Jerry. Jerry, I had no idea. You got that from your dad, huh? The birds are Yes, in I did. The Blue Jays are Maybe in flight. Not. I got that from my dad. And uh, he uh, he was very instrumental in my life. And to be honest, um, uh, while my parents divorced, my mom had more to do with that than uh, my dad did. Sadly, I'm not going to go into details there. But after high school, John, I really did not want to. I had no interest in going to college. And uh my dad said to me, and he was a graduate of Penn State years ago, and he felt the value of uh, uh, university education. He said, Jerry, I think you should go to college, uh, a university. And I said, well, I don't know. And he said, here's why. The Vietnam War has started. And if you don't go and get a class two deferment, 
and have four years of an education where you don't have to be drafted and go to Vietnam as a, an infantryman uh, down there on the, on the ground, you could easily pass away. And I thought about that and I said, Dad, you're exactly right. I need that class to confirm it right now because this was the beginning of a sad history in the States with Vietnam. So he took me to the University of Santa Clara and he had a friend who lived right across from the campus, Joe Sullivan. And Joe said, I'll take you for a little tour. And so we toured Santa Clara and that became my school. It was 3,000 students at a Jesuit school and uh, Father Shanks I met there. And it just was a wonderful education. And this again led me to believe that God has uh, a way in our lives and you have to recognize that. And when you do, and you put yourself second to God who's directing your life and say, thank you, Lord. It makes all the difference in the world. That's awesome, man. That, that's right. And then, you know what? You end up in Toronto for all those years, touching so many people's lives. You know, that's the way it works. You know, you, you never would have guessed that. I never thought I'd end up in Toronto, to be honest with you. You know, uh, it's awesome. It really is. It's so good. It's go, good to hear from you and see you. All right, now let's talk about the current Blue Jays. What's going on up there? It's been kind of a roller coaster, huh? Well, it has, uh, including the last really uh, few years. Uh, the last two years, they've gone to the playoffs, been eliminated right there in the first round and very quickly as well. Well, John, when I look at this uh, current crop, I'm going to start right here with um, Alex Anthopoulos. Canadian, born in Montreal, came to the Blue Jays after working for the uh, Expos and put together a wonderful 2015 season, which you were a part of, and uh, people coming and the bat flip home run by Jose Bautista. And it just, it was the beginning of what was going to be a wonderful era here with Alex as the general manager. But for whatever reason, and I won't go into specifics, uh, the Rogers people brought in Mark Shapiro and later Ross Atkins. And much to Alex's credit, because he saw that leadership and decision-making come to an end abruptly without him even knowing about it. He said, no, thank you. Turned down $10 million, five years, $2 million a year. And I really respected that because he wanted to have the authority that he had to take the team at 2015 at the July trade deadline to bring in Troy Tulowitzki and David Price and so many others to make that team viable and just missing going to the World Series. Who will you know? And uh, I just thought there in Kansas City, the Blue Jays were on their way to beating the New York Mets and uh, winning another World Series under your leadership, but especially Alex's leadership. And at that particular point, he was let he, he wasn't let go. He decided, I'm not going to do this. So just to finish with Alex, he'd been gone for eight years, and he's won seven straight division titles, three in L.A., four in Atlanta. He's won a World Series, a Canadian. He, in my mind, is like Pat Gillick. Pat's in the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown. Alex will go to the Hall of Fame at Cooperstown someday, too, because he is that good, that gifted, and has a sixth sense for the game, for people, and it's never about him. He's become one of my best friends, too. We talk to each other every now and then. and uh, So I'm going to start with that. Now, secondly, when I see the Blue Jays this year, I see a starting rotation that's up and down and inconsistent. And some of the acquisitions are good for a game or two and not so good afterwards. I see a lot of talent on the field. Uh, and I might add here for the audience, uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who signed him just before he left? Alex Anthopoulos. And then there's Bo Bichette, and there's, there are others too. But their inconsistency at not hitting with men in scoring position is kind of a reflection too, I think, of the talent base that Alex had built up. And the talent base here, for me, John, is too inconsistent. It's up and down. And I think that reflects exactly where they are now, about six games over 500, 11 games back. And it's just kind of... Uh, Sad to see, but also for me, kind of expected to. Well, hey, anybody, not many people know the game up there more than you do, pal. Hey, let me ask you something. So, so you left the States for Canada. Alex leaves Canada for the States without answering this. Which one of you is smarter? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know what? I don't, I can't disagree with you, pal. <laughs> well, uh, it's amazing. I lived the first 35 years, years in the States and uh, I've lived the last 42 years of my 77 years here in Canada. And if somebody would have told me growing up, you'll spend more years in another country than the U S I would have said, there's no way, but Canada has been a wonderful place to live, to raise our kids, 
Joe still lives here with his wife, Kathy, and our five-year-old grandson, Wes. Ben graduated from Purdue in 2000. Uh, he went to work for a company there in Chicago, and that was 22 years ago. Now he runs the company. And Joe, a year later, graduated from Notre Dame. Uh, we loved that was our background. Mary is from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and went to the University of Michigan. And so we we had that U.S. background that led to our kids going to Purdue and Notre Dame. And so overall, when I think about that, too, I'm so happy that they were educated doing their own thing now. But I never dreamt that we would be in Toronto. And this is where we'll end our lives. Why? Because it's so comfortable here and the people are so good. And Toronto has been just such a blessing. And then to go across Canada like I did, uh, meeting so many people, it's been just a wonderful experience. And I know you share a lot of that with me, too. Yeah, Jerry, you know what? Hey. Hey, Canada, Canada has been good to both of us. You know, you've been good to Canada and in uh, Toronto and it's, it's been, it, it was a match. It was, it was just, it was just supposed to happen, you know? And, uh, well, Hey, so, uh, you know what, Jerry, it's good to see you, pal. You know what? Uh, I, I've missed you. I know, I know the people up there too miss, miss hearing you call the games. Uh, and you know, a lot of these young guys are, they, they got a chance to meet you. You know, uh, you've impacted so, so many lives. And more importantly, just other than the game of baseball in life, you've impacted so many people. And in, in, uh, so we appreciate that, man. We appreciate you coming on here. Johnny, you got anything else for him? This is no, a uh, legend. Has been, this has been uh, just a pleasure for me and uh, to hear the stories and just to ask a few questions of a legend. Uh, it's been uh, my pleasure to just be able to be a part of this. Well, I want to just wrap, I just want to wrap it up here and say that uh, I have one sister. I never had a brother until I met John Gibbons. And for me, he's the brother I never had. And when you have a brother like that, too, you share your heart, you share your feelings, you share everything that is involved with your lives. And John and I have done that our entire lives and with our kids and grandkids. And that's what it's all about. And I, I just couldn't ask for a better blessing than when I talk about a person, John Gibbons being in my life, and here we are to this day, and we always will be until there are no more days. Oh, you're the best. Hey, I got one last question, though, before we let you sign off. You said on your book, you, you said uh, you wrote it down to like a, a hundred thousand something. What is it? How many words? If you penned what? it, you were saying something about. Oh, oh yeah, I wrote I over two years, over two off seasons. I wrote 120,000 words and edited it down to 102,000, and that was the book. And I was going to say, that's to me, that that's not enough, man, because you say 102,000 words in an hour, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a, great, here's a great one to end on, and this is a true story, and this says a lot about me, and it says a lot about you. One day, our son, Ben, came home in the third grade, and he said, Dad, I'm afraid I flunked my mathematics test. And I said, Ben... That's negative. Around our house, we want you to be positive. He said, Dad, I'm positive. I flunked my mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, thanks for having me. We are two of the most positive people ever and happy to share this with all of your listeners here on this Zoom. Hey, and if, if our fans are going to love it, man. It's good to see you. That, and uh, we all miss you. We'll do it again sometime, pal. Yes, we will. God bless you, John. Thanks, pal. Take Thank care. You. I say it every week, and that was indeed another great gabbing with Gibby. And wow, I mean, I was just kind of like, I was getting cold chills a little bit listening to some of these stories. What a legend. What a legend that we had. On you know what, John, he's one, just one of the good guys. You know, he, he, you know, he had a, a, a tremendous baseball career, but he's just a, just a good human being that cares about others, will do anything for anybody, and always – Always conscious of helping people. And you, I'm sure you can take, you can gather that from that that interview right there. And uh, yeah, uh, the game misses him. They miss him up there in Toronto. I guarantee you. But he's a legend and uh, and, a, and a good friend. Yeah, and, and you could tell the chemistry and the friendship that you two have had over all the years just incredible. It was a pleasure to be a part of. Uh, what a great guest. Uh, now, John, inspired by our friends over at Miller Lite, uh, let's get to the roast and toast for the week. And the roast uh, this week, continued random discipline on how much is too much stickiness. It happened in New York. The Mets reliever Drew Smith came in 
for a relief appearance. The umpires immediately check his hands. All four of them convene. They toss him out of the game, and he's suspended for 10 games before even throwing a pitch. And then, to make matters worse, the replacement, John Curtis, comes into the game to replace Smith. He's not checked at all. He does his warm-ups, <laughs> and he plays. How do you check a player upon his entering a game, toss him, he gets suspended, and then the next guy, you don't even check? I mean, that's a perfect example of what's going on today. Random. Yeah, j- yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no consistency, really. Maybe they, maybe they would think, "Dang, if this next guy comes in behind and we check him, he's got it too." They're going to run out of pitchers. They won't even be able. To, we got to forfeit the game for crying out. I mean, maybe that's it. Yeah, I think they just need to f- find some, find something that they can, you know, that's fair to everybody. And or you know, if it's check every check everybody when they come off the mound, if you want, not you know, you know, maybe one inning or not, or. Whatever. If they, if it's if you want to be fair, that's the way you're going to have to do it. It's just a little bit of a cluster right now. Um, yeah, they got to figure it out. Know, yeah, but you know, I, I don't know what the answer is. To tell you the truth, it's uniformity, like, but they got to figure it out, as you yeah. said. But, uh, again, but it shouldn't keep happening. No, it shouldn't. Getting into something no. more pleasant. It's the toast for this week, and John is a brand new documentary out on the life of the great Yogi Berra. It's called mm. "It Ain't Over." And it pays tribute to Yogi and his amazing life and career in baseball. You know, the guy's had 13 World Series rings, you know, not as a player and the rest as a coach. Uh, uh, Never won the World Series as a manager, but uh, he is a three-time MVP, Hall of Famer, of course, recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, And one thing about this documentary is the best one I've ever seen on baseball. But you always reference the baseball gods. You talk about the baseball gods a lot. And when I was watching this documentary, there were a couple of unexplained things that could only be attributed to the baseball gods. And I'll reference them. 1964, after Yogi's storied career with the Yankees, they put him in as a skipper. He gets to the World Series in his first year of managing against the St. Louis Cardinals. The Yankees fall short in a game seven. He gets fired. Yogi gets fired, and it's a big outcry. The Yankees don't go back to the World Series until 1976, and that's the year they bring Yogi Berra back as a coach. So there's one example of baseball gods, right? Oh, yeah. Here's example number two. George Steinbrenner. You know, obviously, everybody knows Steinbrenner and his hair triggered, firing, hiring, firing Billy Martin many, many times. He brings Yogi in to manage the team in 1984. They get through the season, 1985. He promises Yogi, you're my manager all year. You're my manager all year. After 16 games in 1985... (laughs) Steinbrenner doesn't even fire the guy himself. He sends Clyde King to fire Yogi. Yogi is like, I'm done with the Yankees. I'm never going back there again. And it wasn't until 1999 when Steinbrenner apologizes to Yogi. He spent 15, 16 years away from Yankee Stadium. So he does the apology. Yogi agrees to come back for Yogi Berra Day. And here's something else about baseball gods. Yogi catches the first pitch thrown by Darn Larson, who he caught in 1956. It was the only perfect game in World Series history. So that was cool. But on that day at Yankee Stadium, in front of Darn Larson and Yogi Berra, David Cohn takes the mound and he pitches a perfect game. Baseball gods. Hey, hey, you know what? Hey, you get punished in this business when you do the wrong things, man. When you're not fair, you're not, uh, or you know, that, that's what you know. Everybody loves Yogi. You know, he's he's one of the characters, true characters of the game, maybe number one. And uh, when he, when there's a little injustice there, people feel that you know, you get you get it, they stick it to you. You it's funny you say that. Well, they you know they didn't they didn't win for the, that length of time. They still got like twenty seven world championships. Yeah, but during that stretch, there weren't any. Uh, that was and yeah, but you, for the Yankees. 
but they had all they won all that stuff when Yogi was was on that team. As well, a yeah, part they, of, as they a were player. in the World Series, I think, eleven out of fourteen years. <laughs> I mean, oh, in the fifties is crazy. Uh, oh, the World yeah. Series, they won five World Series in a row. I mean, uh, they were a dynasty, and Yogi was right there. And another thing they brought up was like he was the you know he's the catcher, he's the architect, he's you know he's positioning the players, he's calling the game, and he, and they said that's why catchers always made the best managers. Yeah, well, yeah, you know, you hear that all the time, and you just got a different perspective on it. You know, you're you're in the nuts and bolts of the game all the time. So, yeah, exactly. hey, everybody loves Yogi, man, and I'm glad they right. they figured that out. That's a, that's a great toast. Yeah, you got to check out the documentary. I highly recommend it to everybody. Corner booths, sticky floors, weekdays that feel like weekends. You never forget the way some things taste. Miller Lite, great taste. 90 calories. Tastes like Miller time. Well, John, that's going to wrap up this edition of the Gibby Show. Don't forget to order a copy of Gibby's book. Back on the bestsellers list, by the way, Gibby Tales of a Baseball Lifer. And it was written by Gibby and Greg Oliver. For John Gibbons, this is John Arezzi. We'll talk more baseball with you here next week on the Gibby Show. Have a great week, everyone, and go Blue Jays. 